uh, we will now start uh, Council Resolution 17-0004R, uh, Quarterly Budget Briefings for the Baltimore City Public School System. Marguerite, did I get that right? Yes, Mr. Chair. Excellent. I was doing it off of memory. All right. Um, who do we have from the school system with us today? Uh, hello, Committee Chair Costello. Um, it's Al Perkins Cohen, uh, Chief of Staff, and I have with me here today um, Chris Doherty, who's our uh, Chief Financial Officer, as well as our Deputy Chief Financial Officer, Marianne Cox. Um, Dr. Santelis uh, had wanted to be here today, but she um, she was going to be here, but she came uh, at three o'clock. She had to leave. Um, she just left uh, to go to the uh, uh, Council of Great City Schools is having an awards ceremony right now um, for uh, the Green Garner Award, which is the um, which she, for which she is a finalist. It's the uh, nation's highest uh, award uh, honoring urban educators um, that have made a contribution into uh, to to education in cities across the United States. So she's one of seven finalists, and so she had to be there uh, right now. So that's where she is. Um, and so, but I'm very happy to be here with you today to um, to talk about where we are at our end of the year closeout. I'm going to turn it over in a Allison. second. Mm -hmm. Allison, real quick, um, we certainly understand her not being here. That that is um, th that's an incredible honor, and and hopefully she wins. What what do we feel like her chances are? How are we feeling? I mean, I feel like they're great because I think she's the best superintendent in the country. I don't have any inside information for you other than to say that what I know to be true, which is that she is the best superintendent in the country. But um, um, I think she has a good chance. Um, she, you know, she really does get a lot of national recognition for the incredible work that she's doing. So, but I don't know. So we will see. Um, it's an illustrious group. There's a lot of great work going on in urban education and we're very pro uh, appreciative right now to be members of that group because there's a lot of learning that's happening right now between school districts within the state as well as across the country um, that's really helping us uh, deal with this unusual situation. So, um, so we will keep see. us updated. Yes, I will keep I've told her to keep me updated because I, I can't be there because I'm here. So I've told her to text me. So I will keep you updated. Um, so, um, yeah, and I'm happy to be here to talk about all we're doing um, um, uh, in terms of the closeout for this year for city schools. Uh, we, like uh, like your budget director, Bob Sename, was just talking about, have been working really hard since, uh, since schools closed on March 13th to uh, try to figure out how to really look at our resources and make sure that we were prioritizing the most important investments in students. Um, we know that in this moment, we need to make sure that students have access to uh, devices. And so we have purchased 55,000 devices uh, to make sure that students have access to those. We have another about 13,000 devices that we've reused that are in schools. So we did a kind of an overview of all the um, devices in our schools, check them, match them with cords, because the way that devices are, um, uh, um, are distributed in schools usually are used in schools are parts of carts where they don't always have cords, but we purchase cords and pair them with those so that we have a total of about 68,000 devices that um, are available for students um, and that would meet the needs of the tra traditional school students. Charter schools also had got a share of the city council funds, which we are very appreciative for, the $3 million that helped us pay for the, those devices. Um, charters got a share of that as well as um, the technology funds um, from ESSER, um, and from the that we got through the state and the ESSER grants and so are using those to help um, make sure they meet the needs of their students. Um, in addition, we had to make sure that we have access to internet for students. So we have, um, we've got, uh, originally we bought 15,000 hotspots and now through this arrangement with T-Mobile, we have another 11,000 hotspots that we're getting to um, provide access uh, to internet for students. And then we also have an arrangement with Comcast where we're um, continuing the payments for internet essentials uh, for students who need help um, you know, making sure that, that that connectivity continues for them. So those were major investments. Of course, like you all too, we also have investments for, for PPE and for, um, for cleaning buildings. Um, and some of the um, the pieces we have in place um, in our buildings to keep themselves safe, like air filters and um, and air purifiers and um, plexiglass shields for desks. So if you go into our student learning centers now, which we have 15 of those in place, where 
where um, people can go um, and students can go to access their virtual learning. Um, those are in place and we prioritized um, students who are um, homeless. And so the majority of students in those um, student learning centers are homeless, as well as um, people, uh, students whose parents work uh, requires them to be outside of their home. So, you know, many of city workers um, uh, are in that um, in in those uh, centers, as well as our staff who have to be outside of their home or just any members of the public who have a work that requires them to be to work in person. Um, the Rec and Parks has been our partner on those um, student learning centers. And I think we've invited uh, the council and others to come see those sites. So we have some tours coming up if folks want to go see them, but those um, are off the ground and um, are really great. And we're hearing great things from parents about how uh, vital they are to um, making sure that they're able to have a safe place for their student to access learning. Um, we also have some in-person learning happening for um, for special ed students and for English language learners, and we're going to be expanding that to also reach um, early learning students. So to meet all those needs, to provide good quality virtual learning, to increasingly provide some in-person learning for students who we know we're just not meeting their needs virtually, we have really been very careful since March to make sure that we are um, reducing costs that are not as much a priority, priority anymore to be able to spend on the, the things that we know to be priorities in this minute. Um, and so you'll see at our end of the year closeout that really intentional attempt to both meet the immediate needs of COVID as well as plan for the long term, because we know that FY22 is shaping up to be probably a particularly challenging year. So Chris will go into more of the specifics. I'll turn it over to him. But again, thanks for uh, having us. And, um, and we look forward to sharing the specifics of, of where we are. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Perkins Cohen. Um, can I ask you, Allison, if you can hear me? Because I'm not, I've been having a wide yes. range of technical issues. Thank you very much. Um, also, I might be pushing my luck, but with um, our uh, CEO uh, in the running for that amazing award, it reminded me that in case uh, the, the council didn't know, uh, in recent uh, days, we we had a uh, another teacher of the year who was named from Baltimore City. So um, perhaps that's well known, but it's worth repeating that uh, why um, Maryland, Maryland teacher of the year. For, forgive me. What did I say? You just said teacher of the year for Baltimore City, but oh, Maryland. Me. No, he, uh, Mr. Wyatt Oroke uh, was the Maryland teacher of the year. Thank you, uh, City Springs a middle school teacher, and it's just fantastic news. It's an extraordinary honor. And wonderfully, it's the third time in six years that a teacher from Baltimore City Public Schools has been named the Maryland Teacher of the Year. So on that positive note, I just thought I would um, uh, share that. And I will start sharing in a moment um, and see how, see if that works. But I will also say that uh, Chief Perkins Cohen's uh, overview was, was excellent and also when Mr. Sename was giving his remarks, uh, I was nodding my head vigorously. Much of the same uh, sets of activities uh, were happening uh, with the school system. Uh, we're trying to utilize every penny of the CARES Act, uh, applying for every bit of reimbursement under FEMA, uh, juggling things like uh, where does where does hazard pay end and a bonus begin and, and uh, stipends and trying to figure out all of those things on the fly um, to make sure we, we do right with all those funds. So it was a very uh, familiar overview and one that I'm going to get into more detail because as we FY20 close out the entire fourth quarter and then and a little bit besides were uh, in the COVID environment. So the the uh, more than a, more than half of March and then all of April, May and June was a COVID environment. So it certainly uh, bears repeating that as we talk about uh, FY20 closeout and where we are in FY21 and beyond, uh, like previous discussions, it's going to be unavoidably uh, COVID uh, uh, heavy. So if I am sharing. Yes, it looks like yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, so just uh, confirming that uh, that you're seeing what I'm seeing. This is our cover slide. What we're hoping to do, uh, and we'll try to be very efficient uh, with your time, but we will continue with our in introductory comments. We will move there to uh, closing the gap because I know I'm not surprising anyone when we say that the the minimum and unavoidable costs uh, associated with managing COVID have uh, far outstripped uh, the additional revenues we've had. 
Uh, and so we've been managing that from the very beginning. And from there, we'll go into more specific discussion of our FY20 general fund revenues, expenditures, and uses. Um, and as I said, it's uh, COVID and how we are dealing with it is threaded throughout all of these um, slides. So first, um, some relevant numbers. We, um, in early August, after we had been doing it from the beginning, but in early August, we put together um, an, an assessment where we took all of our absolutely necessary COVID costs uh, from, from the beginning, and they totaled at least $131 million. And what we're finding is the reason we say at least is because uh, as, as you're experiencing, no doubt, in other facets of uh, city government, uh, if anything, your estimates, uh, only, they only go higher. It's rare that we have estimated X and found out that the, that the true costs have been uh, less than X. They've, they've almost always been X or more. So with our COVID additional costs of 131 million, uh, Mr. Senemay mentioned that the city got $103 million in um, CARES Act funding, every bit of it needed. We got 77 million. Uh, it's driven by formula, uh, as I think we all know, and we, we, we very much appreciated the 77 million. Uh, we also got, uh, again, thank you directly to this body uh, for 3 million vital dollars from the uh, Children and Youth Fund, which went immediately towards technology. Um, in the early days, March, April, May, one of the well, the biggest category of costs that uh, made up that $131 million stack up were devices. Uh, we we found up we found out even more of what we knew, which was there's a, a a chasm, a digital divide that is really gigantic. And when we immediately had to go to the delivery of um, distance learning, virtual education, uh, we we saw and realized that so many of our families and students did not have devices that are uh, able to do meaningful uh, um, virtual instruction or distance learning. So we put $40 million uh, uh, toward just that, you know, getting devices in the hands of, uh, of, of children who need them. And as soon as you have devices, the next thing you need is connectivity. And we became uh, a little bit better versed uh, as finance people, I mean, not as uh, IT people on uh, hotspots and mesh networks and uh, other things like that, all of which cost money. And so we had uh, $7 million towards connectivity that we put in um, you know, nearly immediately. And, and what you see, though, is that even with the extraordinarily um, appreciated $77 million from CARES and from the city of Baltimore, we're, we're nowhere close to the $131 million in um, COVID costs. So what did we do? From the beginning in March, we tried wherever possible uh, to repurpose funds. Uh, to move in allowable ways funds from uh, from one category to another and the old-fashioned way of just trying to save money uh, wherever we can we back in um, back in the spring and summer we estimated that we ought to have approximately 20 million dollars in fy20 closeout funds to apply to covid uh, covid costs and uh, when we did our um, projections, we found that uh, we were expecting to see a $21 million gap. That is the gap referred to in the table of contents because uh, our FY21 budget uh, did not have a single penny in it for COVID related costs. And that, that, that wasn't an oversight. It was a function of a very elaborate and public and uh, multi-step budget uh, development and approval process. And the FY21 budget was approved in May and at the beginning of May, and while we had started experiencing COVID, um, it, it was essentially past the time where we could put anything into our FY21 budget. So um, like in so many other places across uh, the state and the city and country, uh, we entered FY21 where COVID was the story of the, of the year and we didn't have a single penny in COVID costs in our budget. So, oh, um, let's see, my, my slide's not advancing. Uh, Chief Perkins Cohen, is, is yours? It's still on the introduction. Oh, here we go. So when we closed out our books, our fiscal year, of course, ends 6-30-20. Uh, we have three months. It's a 
truncated period of time, but uh, we're able to close, officially close in three months. When we closed our books in uh, formally in FY20, which we did on 930, uh, on 930 per Comar, uh, we were actually able to apply 26 million towards COVID costs which brings our remaining estimated COVID gap down to approximately 11 million. So we had internally estimated 20 million plus or minus 20%, uh, which could get us to 24 million. It turns out we had uh, $26 million um, after um, taking care of uh, other uh, aspects to apply towards COVID, which was good news, which was, which was good, uh, good in the sense that it was a bit more than we projected. And like our CEO said at a school board meeting uh, the other night and at other places, there are certain things that are absolutely essential to have uh, as we uh, continue to educate children and as we contemplate even larger numbers of children coming back to in-person learning. And without belaboring it, I think the most essential is to have clean, safe buildings for children and staff uh, and to have ample amounts of PPE uh, and also to have to continue to have enough devices and enough high quality connectivity to meet the needs of our children. Because even as we talk about bringing children back for in-purpose, uh, for in-person learning, we know that a significant number of families and children are going to stay in the virtual learning uh, environment because that's their decision. That's, that is their decision to make. Uh, people's comfortable uh, levels or comfortability levels vary. And so one family might choose to come back at point X and another family right next door uh, will choose to stay virtual. W what I mean by pointing that out is from a finance perspective, we had to have funds and have to maintain funds that allow us to do all of those things at the same time, continue with the much more robust virtual learning opportunities that we're experiencing this fall than frankly we did at the very beginning of the spring when it first, uh, when it first hit, as well as being prepared for all, um, as many folks uh, as eventually who come back, uh, do come back. So just to put some real numbers to these categories, for the clean, safe buildings, we created a um, assigned fund balance category for building safety enhancements and increased cleaning, and we put nine million dollars uh, towards that. There's there's not much more. There's nothing more important than than having safe buildings and, and having people know that when they come back, these buildings are safe. One subset of the nine million comes in air filters. Uh, we we have. Um, uh, we didn't prior to putting this uh, these funds into the FY21 budget. There was there were no line items for MERV 13 air filters. There were no line items for standalone air, air filtration systems. Sure, there was normal um, normal day uh, air filter kind of uh, things, but that was just standard stuff. All, all of this is above and beyond what was uh, uh, originally uh, forecast. Similarly, with things like masks, and I, and I won't. I won't spend too much time because I feel like this this council is extremely well versed in all these. This is just a view of some of the same things, but from the school perspective, we've at, for starters we've said with PPE, one part of PPE are the masks, and we've we've said okay for starters we're going to give each student three masks, three cloth masks, and each um, employee two cloth masks, and that's over a quarter a million masks right there. And anyone who's been wearing masks recently knows you forget them, you lose them. Uh, you, 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 we have to have uh, enough masks for every child, every student, every day, irrespective of how forgetful he, she, or we might be. Uh, it's just not an option not to have enough masks. It's not an option not to have enough hand sanitizer, the hand sanitizer stands, the soap, everything. These are what we call the non-negotiables, the must-haves. And as I said, none of it had been originally in the FY21 um, budget. Similarly, that's in addition to continuing to provide, let's face it, the very expensive uh, virtual learning and distance learning for our kids. So all of that has led us to make these decisions. Um, also, so uh, Chief Perkins Cohen mentioned it, uh, so I will, I will not spend too much time on it, but frankly, from the beginning, uh, March 12th, when uh, schools uh, went virtual, we have had a healthy uh, awareness of just how expensive uh, keeping uh, 
keeping buildings and children safe and delivering distance learning is. So we put in a spending freeze uh, in the spring. Uh, we also, uh, like Mr. Sinemay mentioned, we instituted a hiring freeze, uh, not generally popular decisions. Uh, we also did case-by-case um, -case reduction in third-party contractor costs because uh, there were a lot of things that were contracted to happen that either didn't happen or happened in a different way, and we needed to go through all those contracts and determine the ones we could uh, kind of put in abeyance and the ones where we could uh, dramatically reduce them, and we, we did all that. Another example uh, is transportation costs. The, the fact of the matter is uh, kids weren't being transported to school buildings anymore, so we, uh, we looked at all of our transportation contracts with an eye towards saving as much money as possible, but also getting back to the CARES Act, um, in accepting certain CARES Act funding, we we have to we we have to to the extent practicable keep people employed uh, and keep money flowing. That was kind of the the overarching idea of of the CARES Act funding. So we we had to strike a balance between renegotiating contracts wherever possible and also uh, making sure that um, we kept people employed to the extent practicable. And with transportation contracts, for example, what we didn't want to do is sever all uh, ties immediately and save a little bit more money and then not have those hardworking, um, value-adding folks available when we did need them to bring children back uh, uh, whenever that may happen. That was FY20. So we started from Jump Street implementing some of those, um, some of those uh, measures. In FY21, uh, we, we did that and some more. Um, again, driven by um, our knowledge of just how expensive all of these activities are and the fact that we had no uh, per se budget for it. So we, we made the decision to discontinue the use of uh, temporary employees effective October 2nd. That was not an easy decision, uh, but it was one that needed to be made in the context of uh, uh, finishing FY21 balanced. Uh, because also, as Mr. Sename said, we don't have the luxury to finish a year out of balance. That's uh, uh, per law. Uh, so we've also, uh, in addition to uh, not continuing uh, cert, uh, temps, uh, temporary workers, we've also continued to repurpose grant funds wherever possible. And we've also implemented another hiring freeze. So we we started one in the spring. We, we relaxed the hiring freeze in the summer because we needed to make sure that we had sufficient numbers of teachers to deal with the um, very high demands of virtual learning and the X factor of how and when we return to in-person learning. All of those scenarios involve necessarily a good number of teachers. So we, uh, but we're back now to having a hiring freeze and um, as difficult as those decisions have been, they have yielded uh, fruit, and we feel better about how we're going to end FY21. Uh, now, the summary of the summary is that right now we feel we are meeting the most immediate challenges. We we feel that because of uh, the funds we've put, uh, the funds that we've identified and put forward in FY21 fund balance, we have a, a, a fair amount of dry powder to deal with those things that a year ago we, we didn't know what those acronyms stood for, uh, you know, COVID, PPE, and other things, uh, we, we feel we have good dry powder. At the same time, we're looking at an FY22 right around the corner that is going to be extraordinarily challenging, and it's going to be uh, extraordinarily challenging for different but compounding reasons. Yes, there will be COVID will still be uh, a factor as far as expenses go, as, as far as uh, things uh, that we will need to do at, at the same time. Right now, FY22 does not contain um, any Kerwin funding. It doesn't contain any bridge to Kerwin funding, the kind of Kerwin light that was that was implemented in order to help us uh, get uh, to, to move and graduate up to the Kerwin level of funding. So that is a triple whammy if there ever was one, which is to say continued COVID realities and costs, no Kerwin, no bridge to Kerwin, and finally, um, the effect of enrollment adjustments on our funding. Uh, we all know that the single most important aspect of our funding is the number of children we're uh, uh, educating in a particular year. 
and we we arrive at that number in the fall of the preceding year. So right now, uh, as we did enrollment counts um, in this very different environment, that's going to uh, lead to FY22 funding. And although the final numbers aren't in, the numbers are going to be lower than what we projected um, for various reasons of folks choosing not to send kindergartners to school just yet or or doing other things. Uh, the FY22, the, the count that we will use for FY22 will in any case be lower than what was projected. So it was with that um, healthy concern about FY21 closing the gap, FY22 um, preparing to the extent possible uh, for what will be a, a, a very difficult year. Uh, that was all part of our context when we uh, closed out FY20. Now, one thing I will say as I go to the, this next slide, and I, I can say it uh, without it being um, self-serving um, because I'm new to the system, for the 11th straight year, uh, city schools received a, uh, a clean audit. Our external auditors do our, uh, a, a very, very thorough uh, audit of all of our financial statements. And for 11 years running, they have been entirely clean, uh, unmodified audits, that is to say, no findings of any kind. And that's uh, remarkable. And I, I want to um, point that out because it's been under the leadership of Chief Perkins Cohen and Deputy uh, Chief Financial Officer Marianne Cox. So these numbers are the FY20 numbers, and this is first the revenue slide. And uh, as one would expect, there's not there's not a lot of difference between um, a budgeted funding and actual funding. Um, the city of Baltimore uh, came in to the penny as as, uh, as you always do, and uh, there were a few other ups and downs. But the net effect of that was five million dollars more out of 1.17 billion. Uh, that was budgeted from the revenue side. Now, from the, let me see if, hopefully that you're seeing the screen that I'm seeing now. From the expenditure side, this is one where we have more control uh, over it. Uh, they're big categories, but uh, we had more than one quarter of FY20 was, uh, was held in a COVID environment. And we implemented the measures that I summarized very briefly a few moments ago. So we did see positive variances in some of the major categories, salary and wages. And of course, fringe just uh, pretty much uh, comes in lockstep uh, with salary and wages for the most part. Contractual services, through our efforts, we were able to, uh, to come up with almost $16 million in budgeted contractual services that we were not uh, that we were not obligated to pay, that we didn't we, we didn't need to pay, we didn't pay. Uh, materials and supplies, you see it as well. And utilities and other charges, uh, that's $9.7 million. That's uh, part of that, of course, is that it, on balance, it's less expensive to run empty buildings with no children than it is. Um, it's a small, it's a small upside uh, from a financial point of view, but wherever possible, uh, we did just that, which was, um, um, and act savings and, and repurposing. And that led to $73 million variance on the um, expenditure side. So when we combine those two numbers, the 5 million and the 73 million, and then we put it in one slide, we see uh, the kinds of funds that we have, uh, we get closer to the funds that we were, had available to apply to COVID. So after, oh, a quick word on, the, on some of the top lines. So first we have to take out the previously uh, board approved uh, other financing sources that was put in for FY21 originally. Encumbrances can vary fairly dramatically year to year. That 4.6 million figure is the, the net sum of a whole lot of uh, other little things, or I shouldn't say little things, individual things that um, uh, where you have commitments that were made in FY20 that carry over into FY21 and it's essentially already spoken for money. The $11.2 million food service loss uh, bears a bit more explanation. Um, we, when we closed the schools in March, uh, we made the determination uh, to continue to feed, uh, continue to provide as many meal sites as we could. Um, and in addition to um, providing meals for children, we provided meals uh, to adults and to the community. 
we're, we went from about 100,000 meals a day um, to 10, 11, 12, 13,000 meals a day. Um, and we maintained our, um, our staff at, at the previous uh, levels. As you all know, as decision makers, if you have a 90% drop in revenues and you maintain all of your costs, you're going to have a significant uh, loss. And we did uh, to the tune in FY20 of $11.2 um, million. We have gotten right now to mention while we're on food services, we're back to having uh, 83 um, sites. Uh, we have meal, meal service at 83 sites across the city. Uh, our daily food numbers or meal counts are up around 30,000 and climbing uh, as people get um, uh, more familiar with which schools are meal sites and which are not. Um, we get our, uh, the revenue that we get from meals is from the USDA. It's, it's, it goes into our enterprise fund. It's not a general fund category. Uh, and this, of course, is a general fund um, uh, discussion. But anytime that enterprise fund has a loss, it relies on the general fund to make up for that loss. So that's why you're seeing an entry uh, for food services, which is governed by enterprise funds uh, in the general fund summary. And then with the, the remaining funds, you'll see the theme uh, jumps right off the page and that's COVID. Um, we applied all the money that we could to the COVID uh, costs that we had not budgeted for, but that we had been dealing with for several months. That is the building prep fund of 9 million, the PPE, where I talked about masks, but it, it, uh, it's barriers, uh, it's signage, it's, and a lot of those are, um, they need to be replenished on an ongoing basis, and it's the technology for another 9 million. We also um, allocated 19 and a half million uh, to food services in FY21. Uh, we want to get our meal counts up uh, as, as high as we can, because every meal served is a, is a meal uh, eaten and enjoyed, and and that's that's what our food service folks do. With 83 sites open now, our numbers are not going to be they're not going to get back to the 90 to 100,000 level. So no matter the timing of the return to in-person learning, we're going to have a loss in FY21 uh, in food services. Uh, we don't know how great it will be. We will work very hard to make it as small as possible, but I think it's entirely. Uh, unavoidable that there will be a loss and we have to be prepared for that. And the final uh, item is actually the, the only non-COVID item in that list, and that is um, a little over two and a half million uh, as we continue to uh, transition from our current enterprise resource planning system uh, to a new one. We have uh, approximately a two decade old Oracle uh, system that we're uh, transitioning away from, uh, which is a very large and multi-year process and um, we put aside a little over two and a half million for that purpose as well um, and I suppose it, it isn't directly COVID related but it certainly will help us uh, uh, deal with the additional accounting reporting requirements and tracking requirements that uh, the federal funds and, and everything else uh, require. Um, I think I'm not sure if there's another slide after this or not and Oh, no, I guess that's, I, I hope I didn't go on too long, but I wanted to give as much context as I think uh, the numbers uh, at a minimum required. Chris, thank you. Uh, Chris or Marguerite, could you please take down the presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions for city schools? No questions for me. Councilwoman McCray. No question, Mr. Shear. Thank you. Council Vice President Middleton. No questions. Chris, is this your first time testifying in front of the council? Yes, it is. Um, my first time. Apparently you did good because no one has any questions. So. <laughs> I like that you guys are giving it to him easy the first time. That's nice of you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Beginner's don't don't expect it the next time. Don't expect it the next time. <laughs> I, I like you letting him phase in. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, Thank Chris you. Allison, um, I'd like to have uh, city schools come back um, when we have BBMR back. 
just to do a, a presentation that really just focuses on COVID. Uh, we can talk sometime next week. I'm, I'm thinking sometime in the latter half of, of November. Um, sure, that'd be great. To get a, an update on, on COVID specific things. I know you covered a lot of them, uh, so it may just be a regurgitation of some of those materials, but I think that'd be useful for the council. Uh, colleagues, if there's no other questions, City Schools, thank you very much. Best of luck to uh, Dr. Santelises. And yeah, I'm gonna jump over to that. Thank you guys so much. It was good to see everybody. We're now in recess.